Okay, so um, we're going to start now. Hopefully everyone can see the screen and hear me clearly. Um, my name is Hugh Wierski. I'm the founder and technical director of Partel. Um, really excited to host the second series in our session in our webinar series. Um, before we get started, I want to talk a little about the EEBS event. The key theme of this year is empowering you for NZEB. Uh, the NZEB event is part of a collaboration between some of the most knowledgeable experts in the low energy building industry. Um, Partel, in partnership with CORE, Daikin, Nordan and Harmony Timber Solutions are responding proactively to the recent changes in the building regulations. And in the coming two weeks, we'll provide an integrated approach to sustainable building design and construction in accordance with NZEB requirements. The CPD webinar series will present a range of envelope and building performance solutions that aim to help uh, you meet NZEB standards for both new build and retrofit projects. You're invited to join us on a repeat um, basis for the next two weeks. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our media sponsor, um, Passive House Plus magazine for their kind support. Um, everyone at Passive House Plus and Jeff Colley included are an incredible information resource and absolutely focused on energy efficient, healthy, sustainable buildings and in a world with I suppose lots of um, information out there. It's a really ethical, um, high quality source of information. So to introduce you to our um, speaker today, um, the, it's presented by Andrew Butler, Technical Business Development Manager at Core Insulation. Andrew will be talking about Core's EPS solutions that meet and exceed Part L 2019. He'll also be looking at case studies technical services and much more. Um, Andrew himself has an extensive background in engineering and architecture, specializing in low energy construction with a fabric first approach. He's been working on projects across the UK and Ireland, designing sustainable residential and commercial properties, as well as working on large commercial and civil projects with CORE's void formers. He has a passion for climate change and the energy consumption of buildings and aims to promote and educate sustainable living to all. Um, as we get started, I'd kind of ask that there's a, there's a Q and A section, feel free to pop your questions in there during the presentation and we'll have a Q and A at the end. I'll hand you over to Andrew now who will we'll get started. Thanks you, much appreciated. Um, great to see so many people have joined us today. Um, we'll get into my presentation, and as as, as you mentioned, if um, if anyone's any questions as as we go along, <clears throat> feel free to to use that 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 Q and A thing, and then sure we'll have we'll have opportunity at the end um, to get through the questions, and as well see if anybody needs any any assistance or, or for further information. So that's my email address there. I'll pop it up on the, the last slide as well. And um, just if you, if you have anything specific you want to send me, please feel free to send it through. Well, even if it's not directly for myself, I'll get it to, to the right the right person within, within our company. Um, and we'll, we'll take it from there. We'll, we'll see what we can do for you. So just a, a little bit about ourselves first. Uh, hopefully it won't bore you too much, <laughs> but we'll have to mention who we are and where we came from and that kind of stuff. So we're core insulation. Uh, we manufacture EPS, which is expanded polystyrene. So as I talk about EPS during the, the presentation, that's what it means, essentially expanded polystyrene. We're an Irish company, guaranteed Irish company, um, family owned operation in business over 22 years, based up in, in Cavan, but we cover the, the whole country. And then also we, do, we deal a certain amount in the UK as well. We have all the up-to-date ISO certifications. We are the first company in the country to have all the, the up-to-date 9001, 14001. Uh, and then obviously we have various BBA certs and SEI certs for, for our products. So just a, a little bit about, about EPS itself and to, I suppose understand the different forms that it comes in and, and what we can do with it. So the picture on the left-hand side here, you'll see this kind of little white granular sugar, as we call it, which is the raw material. So this is the form that we get it in initially. When we, we hit it with steam and heat, we expand it and we make the, the bead form initially. So that's the, fir the first step in the, the, the production process. The bead can be used for our cavity wall insulation, which I'll, I'll go through shortly. 
Um, from there, we can take the bead and put it into to large block molds and make very large blocks. As you see here on the right hand side, these are 3.6 meters high uh, blocks of EPS. There are two different colors. There's what we call a silver, and then there's the white, which probably people are more familiar with. In both of those, there's different densities. Um, depending on how much material per cubic meter we put in, we can make different densities for different uses, whether it be structural, standard floor insulation, whatever it may be. So that's just then a little bit about the background of it. Um, so there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of materials out in the market at the moment. Um, obviously, from the insulation point of view, there, there, there's lots of different things out there. If you're looking for something tried and tested, well, certainly EPS can give you that. Um, as you can see, just I did a, a, just a quick timeline on it there. Uh, EPS in its, its current form, it's, it's 70 years uh, on the go. So BASF developed EPS in 1951. After various iterations of, of polystyrene, we came to the expanded version in 1951. So it's tried and tested. It's been on the market for a long time. So it's proven it in its abilities and what it can do. So as I said, the, the, there's lots of materials out there, whether it be um, insulation or anything in the market, there's lots of materials. So I suppose what we, cho what we choose, we, there's a lot of process that we need to go through to decide what we're going to use, what we're going to specify, you know, why we're using it, what are the benefits of it. So a little bit about EPS and why you might choose it over another product on a, on a project. Um, EPS is 98% there, so it works very well thermally. Um, because it's 98% there, I just put in that little note as well there, for every litre of oil that is used to manufacture EPS, we can potentially save 200 litres of heating oil uh, on the lifetime of the product because it's so, I suppose, a minimal amount. It is a man-made product, but there's a minimal amount of oil used in the production of it there. Um, price performance ratio, when you compare EPS to, to another product uh, on the market, we should be able to use an EPS and save money on our product. And that's always a very welcome thing, certainly doesn't decompose um, and lifetime application. So physically and thermally, uh, if you're looking at specifying it, using it on a project, day one has a certain thermal conductivity and thermal performance and physical performance. If you look at that product 50 years down the line, it's going to be doing exactly the same thing. There's no gas is used within the manufacturing process of the EPS to gain a lower thermal conductivity, which those gases can then escape and reduce its thermal performance. So EPS, does exactly what it says in the tin. As you can see from the timeline, it's around a long time. Um, even just using it on site, um, water is not an issue, moisture is not an issue. It can get wet, you can pour concrete directly on TPS if you're using it in a floor. And again, it doesn't affect it. So that's a great thing. Certainly when you're working on sites in Ireland, there's a very good high chance the material could get wet. Again, other materials on the market, we're not supposed to get them wet. So that's a great thing about EPS. Simple thing, light and easy to work with on site. Even just cutting a sheet of EPS, there isn't a dust off of it in the same way you might get something else. Uh, in terms of its, I suppose, environmental credentials, um, EPS really kind of stacks up there really, really well. It's very strong. Um, we don't use any gases within the manufacturing. There's no off-gassing from the product as, as well. So there's no CFCs or HCFC gases there. It is recyclable. We recycle all our own offcuts in the factory ourselves. So that's a great thing to have to have a product that is recyclable. We can manufacture it and shape it. And you see that more when I get into our insulated foundation system, the various types of things that we can do with the product and how we can size it and shape it. Uh, I'm not going to do, do a huge amount on part L and building regulations. Hugh covered this very, very well last week. And I'm sure people are very familiar with it at this stage as well, having, having, having uh, listened to Hugh tell us about the, the information that changes the part L. The big thing, I suppose, is around the fabric. That, that's, that's the big thing that I'm looking at from an insulation point of view. If we can get our fabric right, if we can do it in, a, in a, an efficient way from ter in terms of our spend and, our, and, our, and our, even our method of construction, it's got to be a good thing. Okay, If we get that right, maybe we can save money in other processes within the build. Just something just to mention on the, I suppose, renovation. So down around here, where we're looking at the, the renovation part of a building, if we're affecting more than 25% of the building, we're into a deeper renovation. So just, again, something to be aware of. Okay, so I think people in the industry, <laughs> I think this is, a, this is a fair representation on times. Uh, depending on the day that's in it, of course, can change from one day to the next. There's a lot of pressures uh, in the industry at the moment between we have all we have the new the new regulations from Part L in that has a lot of implications of what we're doing from a design point of view, from the construction point of view. There's we're trying to comply with the regs. 
that's having possibly having a push. But again, if we do it right, not necessarily the case onto the the cost of the bills so we've the we're trying to build faster we're trying to possibly save money we've time constraints skilled labor shortages all these compliance issues that are out there part b of the of the, the regulations looks like it might change shortly as well and then we're worried about as well what's our environmental impact and what we're doing in the bills so there's a lot of pressures out there and hopefully when you kind of see the, the the systems that we can provide the types of products that we can provide and using eps should hopefully help you win through some of those issues. So the first thing we're going to look at is wall insulation. So our target wall uh, insulation value for our, our, our new part L requirements as of the, the 1st of November 2019 is 0.18. So that's what we're kind of the figure we're going to start, start at for some of our, our examples on the, the uh, wall insulation. So we're going to look at bonded bead. So we've two types of bonded bead. We've this silvery color and we've a darker gray color. So that's that bead that you would have seen at the start. That's the first uh, process in the production of EPS when we expanded into a bead. We pump that under pressure along with a bonding agent into a cavity to form an insulating mass. Uh, very, very simple idea in terms of its application. I suppose you have to know what you're doing, obviously, at the same time, but it's a simple way of insulating a cavity. And this, again, there's lots of ways of, of looking at insulation for cavities as a board, as a bead. You know, why would you use one thing over another? Um, bonded bead has a lot of advantages. Certainly if it's thermal performance, because it's EPS, it's going to do exactly the same thing uh, over the lifetime of the building. It's not going to change in, in its physical and its thermal performance. We can save money over, over uh, boards in cavity construction, even with going with a wider cavity for a bead. I did costing recently, uh, being, being fair to, to board construction and getting cost off contractors. And even if we're going with a slightly wider cavity, we can still save money on a project by using a bead. We're completely filling the cavity. We're removing the risk of insulation gaps, poorly fitted materials. Uh, we're eliminating thermal loop, and I'll go a little bit into that shortly, uh, which is a big cause of heat loss. It can be used in passive house construction. Uh, again, we can do wide cavities and get to low U values if, if we need to. In terms of the, the material itself and how it's delivered, how it goes to site, it's only in, installed by a registered installer. So it's a professional contractor that comes to site that does the work. Um, so these people are audited by the NSCI, the registered with the NSCI, and also audited by ourselves as a, as a manufacturer. So under our uh, NSCI agreement search, these people install the product. So you're getting a, a, you're getting a, a, a professional fit. You're getting a, a professional contractor coming to site. We don't have an on-site waste issue the same way as we would have board. If we're, if we're fitting board in a cavity, we're cutting around windows and doors. There's, there's elements, maybe 10 to 15% in some cases, going into, a, into a landfill, going into skips. When we get a bonded bead, the contractor comes to site, pumps the cavity, and that's it. So you're only paying for the material that goes into that cavity. There's nothing going into the skip. In terms of, of savings, the, there is a cost saving. The, there's a time saving as well. Um, even just speaking to contractors themselves, Buildability is a lot quicker. The, they can get the walls up if we're looking at, at uh, in this case, masonry construction. The walls go up, roof on, windows and doors in. The, the insulation comes in later on. So we can get the, the, the building up quicker and watertight quicker. I suppose some of the, the ideas, again, behind bonded bead and regular questions we would get is, um, you know, is it, if we're filling the cavity, the old idea of making a cavity in construction leaving an air gap there to deal with moisture was the way that people were, were approaching cavity builds. Um, if we're filling that cavity, is there an issue with moisture ingress? Uh, basically, the, as you can see there, this, this little diagram here, when the beads go into the cavity, they're pumped at, at severe pressure. They, they push out the air over the cavity and they form an insulating mass. But there is still a small path for any moisture. So on the outer leaf, if there was a crack, an issue with the joints, uh, water got through, it would still flow down through the EPS beads as it would normally do in a cavity and come out the, the, the weep holes at the bottom. So that's not a huge issue. Um, these are all tested as part of our, our BBA and NSAI certification. We do all these wet wall tests. Some things to be aware of are the exposure zones and I'll show you what they look like. Um, so, you know, it's a regular question. If we're filling that cavity, is there an issue? No, it's not in terms of, of moisture from, from a standard masonry construction. Just a little bit on thermal looping. So Lecompte in 1990 looked at thermal looping. Okay, and the idea was, I suppose, looking at, at cavity wall construction, we have a, an inner leaf. So this is our warm leaf. We have an outer leaf. We have this cavity. And what we're ideally trying to do is get a board 
the uniform board tight to that inside leaf, tight against that wall, um, trying to keep the heat within that wall. Now, I suppose from a practical point of view, actually fitting that product might necessarily look like what we have in theory. So LeCompte was looking at, well, if we have any sorts of air gaps, is this going to cause an issue? So even a three millimeter air gap at the back of the board, and if you can imagine if, if there's any sort of mortar, they're going to kick it out. If there's a wall tie, maybe not sitting right, it's going to kick that board out. Or if it's not sitting tight to the next board, this is going to be an issue. If there's any sort of air movement in there, it's going to pull the heat out of that inner leaf, drag it out into the cavity, and it's going to dissipate it. So that board's not doing what it's supposed to. And obviously, as you can see there, the bigger the gap, the worse it is. When we look at it in, in real life situations, this is what you're dealing with. So the, 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 the picture on the left is your typical retrofit scenario. So a bonded bead could be used here. It could push that board maybe tighter to that inside leaf, um, but we still have our air gap here. We can add a bead to that. This is a new build picture. There was a guy who had a post on LinkedIn, uh, very disappointed with the fit and finish of his, of his boards in his cavity. So, and the picture on the right, something similar. So to be fair to, to the guys that are probably fitting these boards a lot of the time, they're not necessarily trained overly well in how to fit them. And they're doing it as part of bringing up the walls, their brick laying uh, tasks. So these are the issues that we're trying to get away from by using a bond bead. Reduce that thermal, uh, that thermal looping, get a, I suppose, a more efficiently uh, fitted product, time savings, cost savings. We can, we can do all this with a, with a bonded bead. Just some things to be aware of in terms of the NSEI agreement cert when we're looking at bonded bead. And this would be the same with most manufacturers at this stage. We were the first in the, the country again to have our updated NSEI cert with some of these changes. So on the left-hand side, if we're looking at a brick finish, so brick, we have to look at and be careful at the, the, the mortar joints. So the mortar joints here, we see typically used to be only a flush joint allowed, but we have a recessed joint starting with a bucket handle, a wider stroke and a recessed joint up to four millimeters. They prefer to see those slightly compressed mortar joints because it gives them more weathering. Uh, one way of ensuring that we get complete fill, again, that's, that's a regular question if we're, if we're pumping a bead, how can we ensure that the cavity is completely filled with an insulation material? As part of our tests, the, the, the BBA and NSCI certification, we do, we do uh, wall tests. But we also have uh, drill patterns. So when a contractor goes to site, if it's a new build or if it's retrofit, they have specific drill patterns to ensure that Bead goes completely into that cavity, seals all around the windows and the heads, all the places that it needs to go. Um, they can also measure the volume of material that goes from the truck versus what's supposed to go into the cavity. And there's various means and ways that you can check to make sure that there's a complete fill. One thing to be aware of, and again, it's the same with uh, bead contractors uh, in all parts of the country, is the exposure zone map. So this map here, we see this light and the dark green. The dark green is, is considered a severe exposure area. So if you're looking at a new build with a brick finish, brick is considered a porous material, we cannot pump that cavity as a, uh, as a new build. It has to be a standard masonry rendered finish. If we're looking at it um, in a retrofit situation, we can inspect the cavity uh, once it's over three years old, and we can decide, well, if the cavity is functioning correctly, the mortar joints are correct, well, then as a retrofit, it may work. Um, we can use uh, standard masonry rendered finish anywhere in the country, and brick can be used for a new build, no issues at all in that normal exposure zone. So wind-driven rain is, is the reason for the, the creation of that map there. But again, just something to be aware of. Some new value examples. And again, I'm talking about buildability and, you know, making things easy for ourselves and getting to our targets. So our new backstop U value is 0.18 for a wall uh, under the new Part L 2019. So 170 mil of a standard enough construction cavity will get us to that new U value of 0.18. The picture I have here on the right is uh, a contract that was uh, fitted with um, bonded bead from ourselves. Um, it, it, the, the contractor was Cunningham Contracts. They've actually used on a few projects now. Um, and if you went and spoke to the, the, the foreman, the site manager there, they'd say they'd never build a, a cavity again with, with boards. They just, in terms of the buildability, so this is the thing that, that matters to them on site. They're not having to look over somebody who's, who's fitting not have to look over the shoulder of somebody who's fitting a board in a cavity. They know they can get the walls up, get the, 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 the structure airtight, watertight, 
um, get the, the, the insulation into the cavity then. Um, so their build period, their program really kicks on after that. They know that they can save money on the bill by using a bead as well. So these people, you know, they back up everything that we say and there's, there's more out there. So 170 mil of a cavity will get us to our new requirements of 0.18. Now we can look at, obviously we can go with a wider cavity and this one up here. If we went for something like a 200 mil cavity, we might see a U value somewhere around 0.15. And again, because it's a bonded bead, to go that extra 30 millimeters in material fitted is probably going to cost us maybe another two to three euros a square meter. So there isn't a big, huge cost implication. So again, we're talking about fabric. We get the fabric right. We're not leaning so much on the processes that go into the build. We get the fabric right. It makes life easy for everybody. Interesting enough, the, the, the option tree here on the, on the right-hand side, which, which I have here as well, just an example. If somebody has a project, they've already designed it as a 150 mil cavity. That's the way they build. They're using maybe a, an insulated board internally. We can still use a bonded bead in that cavity and get to our 0.18 U value with an insulated board internally. Even something that's only 20 millimeters of an EPS will get us there. And again, we're going to get that buildability, the cost savings, we're reducing our thermal looping. So... There, there's many uh, may, uh, ways and means of, of getting to the product specifications that we need to do. In terms of interstitial condensation, thermal modeling, we've looked at all this. So I, we knew that the, the changes were coming in, par, coming in Partel. We knew that there was going to be a, a push on fabric. So we developed a whole raft of, of details we have uh, typical details for most constructions and we've terribly modeled every single one of them. So somebody can come to us and say, oh, we're, we have a project here. We can give them the design guide, which shows them th their typical detail. We can give them a U value table, which shows them the thickness of the need. And we can give you your thermal modeling. So in this case scenario, this uh, psi value here, this, this junction, the floor to wall is 0 0.045. Our psi value down here is 0 0.058. So Obviously, if, if it's something project specific, we can look at that for you. But it, it, interestingly, like if, you, if you're looking at an ACD, your psi value with that is 0 0.08. But if you use an enhanced detail and using our products and our details, you can use the thermal modeling, which goes with that, which means that you can get your A2 ratings or A1 ratings, whatever you're aiming for, easier and quicker and save money on, the, on the, the project as well. So all that that is available from ourselves. We're always happy to, to share that information with people. We've modeled and details there and all these are, are NZ, Partel and beyond details uh, around heads and sills and, and uh, roof junctions and all that kind of stuff. So we have all that there available as well. Please feel free to get in contact with me if you need anything on that. Next thing is external insulation. And the way external insula insulation works is a little bit differently in terms of its NSEI certification. Us as a manufacturer, we have our NSCI cert for our bonded bead product. When it comes to external insulation, our insulation, so we're seeing there, that's our EPS silver, our silver EPS there as, as a, an insulation material. We, comp we supply that as a component of the overall render system. So the people who supply the render system, they have the, the, the agreement certification for the product and ours is a component of it. Um, but we supply a lot, of it, a lot of the EWI material that's just a typical buildup of a, a standard uh, EWI uh, build. We have our we have our we have our block. We have our, our adhesives and our mortars, mechanical fixings into the insulation board themselves. So that's just our, our block back there. We have a base coat, meshes if required. Um, obviously, we can double up on on mesh requirements if if it's a very highly trafficked area to really reinforce that. Um, and a render finishes and then you can get brick slip finishes there's all sorts of things there if we're looking at um i suppose compartmentalization we've duplexes additional houses we'd have fire stops at the at the joints and stuff like that so that's just to show you i suppose the typical build-up and why would you use ewi over cavity wall construction if we're looking at masonry construction it's a very very way i suppose reducing our thermal bridging um, detailing on site, detailing from, from an office point of view when we're looking at, at designing this building, it can make life very easy for us. We're certainly going to use, uh, make good use of the thermal mass. So the ability of the buildings envelope to store that heat using that block work very, very effectively, um, that's a big benefit. 
Uh, the insulation is, is, is we're moving it as far out as possible. So we're not having it in the cavity, we're moving it outside of that block work. So the dew point, the, the condensation point is moving further and further out of the building, which is a great thing. The further out the, the condensation risk is, the better it is for everybody. It can also assist with, with air tightness, with, with, our, with our wall structure as well. When we use it, in, with, I suppose, along with our proper air tightness membranes and treatments that we would normally use. I suppose looking at the future at the EWI, um, it, it's, it's, it's a huge market and retrofit at the moment. There's a lot, a lot of retrofit going on with it. Um, new builds is starting to get more and more popular, certainly from the one-off builds, and we're seeing more and more developments kind of leaning into the, the EWI space now. The, the great thing was, I suppose recently is that over the last few years that there's more and more systems on the market, which makes it more competitive. So the more competitive something is, uh, the prices start to, I suppose, get a little bit lower. There's more competition in the market. There's the, the, when we look at cavity wall versus EWI, EWI used to be more expensive. But, I mean, for building, we have scaffolding on site. We have plasters on site. So there's no reason why we can't build EWI uh, roughly the same price. And that seems to be what it's coming in at. Um, specifiers may be looking at EWI in terms of how the, the, everything performs and, and their ener energy efficient bills, bills. So we're seeing more and more of it coming through. In terms of just a couple of uh, examples on new build. So if we're looking at EWI, standard 215 block, um, hitting our new backstop requirement to 0.18 of a U value, we're going with probably 160 mil of our silver EPS there. So 160 mil would get us there to that new U, U value requirements. Again, you might look at the project and you might say, well, if I'm going the 160, sure, I might as well do 200 mil. What will that get me? So we're probably going to see around the 0 0.14, 0 0.15 maybe in a U value. Again, depending on the construction itself, it might have a slight implication in the internal finishes, but that's typically what, what we're going to see in terms of U values. Um, and again, because it's an EPS product, to go from that 160 to the, to the 200 mil, a couple of, a couple of euros a square meter or more, because it's an EPS, it's not a huge project, uh, our, our project product price, sorry, not project, product price. So the renders are going to be the same. The, the labor is going to be the same. Everything else is going to be the same. So all you're paying is for a slightly thicker insulation board. There's not a huge cost difference there. But again, we can get lower U values with that fabric, maybe reduces the spend and the reliance on other, other, other points within the build itself. Um, I just threw in a couple of slides on retrofit and the things as well because they're typical scenarios. We're seeing a lot of this now where people have a cavity wall. They've come along, they've, they've added a bead to that cavity. So you typical cavity, we have our, our maybe a white EPS board. We stick a 50 mil of bonded bead in there. We've done the cavity. And the next point that they want to go to is ex external insulation. So even in a retrofit scenario, we can get to that low U value now, 0.18, very, very simply. So we've updated our, our cavity, we've pumped it. We can put a 70 mil of VPS externally onto that, and we're going to get to that 0.18. And normally people are probably putting about 100 mil external insulation on. So we're going to get beyond that U value again. But again, we're, there's no issues in, in a retrofit why we, can't, why we can't do that. And just something to be aware of in terms of older buildings, when you're getting those really big thick walls, 500, 600 mil old stone, old stone walls, external insulation, it's reducing that condensation risk. It, internal, it can be very, very difficult to get it right just to make people aware of that. Externally, it works very, very well. Again, we, we, we've a huge amount of thermal mass to use there. So I mentioned that, that our insulation is part of, a, it's a component of an overall system. So this is the, the, these are the typical suppliers of EWI in the market here. It's, I'm sure they're names that people all know. We would supply our insulation as part of that. And just an example, a before, during, and after. Um, I'm sure everybody knows what it looks like going on, but just to show you so some ideas about it. Okay, so we're getting into floors now. So backstop requirements have changed on the floors. So we've, we're down from 0.21 to a 0.18 requirement. Now, if we're using underfloor heating, our requirement is 0.15. That's stayed the same since the, from the previous uh, regs. Um, just a little bit more on the densities, because when we start to get into floors, this becomes a little, this, this becomes more important to us, the density of material. So as I said, EPS is expanded polystyrene. When we, I start talking about EPS 70, 100, 150, 200, 300, they're the, the compressive strengths of the materials. So it's very, very simple. An EPS 70 has a 70 kPa compressive strength. 
and we have them in whites and silver, white and silver, and the last two are white on the, on the very, very dense ones. So just to kind of give you an overview. So different density, depending on what their use is, we decide what one we're going to do. In, in domestic scenarios, like commercial, 95% of the time, it's an EPS 70 silver is probably what we're going to be using there. But just to kind of give you an overview. So if, you, if you're getting anything from us, there's the EPS 70 there under a screed. Uh, Underfloor heating pipes, you know, just, just a, a typical buildup. So when you're seeing information come true from us, or, or if you're going across it, when you see those EPS 70s, hundreds, and all that kind of stuff, it, it should make sense to you. Um, again, it's just some typical floor buildups. We've a screed, insulation, and a concrete subfloor. Perimeter area ratio 0.4. Our, our target is 0.15 because we're using underfloor heating here. Uh, 150 mil of our core floor, our silver EPS, will get us to that U value requirement. So 150 mil. So we can go onto a project, we can use our EPS, we can use it uh, in, in moist, damp conditions, we can pour the concrete straight onto it, we can save money on the project, we can use an EPS that's going to do U value, thermal, physical performance over the lifetime of the building without any queries or issues there. So EPS, very, very suitable for there. Uh, another typical floor buildup, 150 mil slab onto insulation onto our stone buildup. We have to probably go a little bit, tiny bit thicker, 160 mil of EPS in that scenario. But again, these are just typical, typical uh, ideas and new values. We have like the core fill and the external insulation we design guys with lots of details, lots of buildups and, and uh, new value charts. So if you need any information, we're always happy to send that on. In terms of the commercial and just a few examples where you would use it, we're using the EPS 300 in the heavier floors. So the likes of these car showrooms where we have cars moving about being parked. Uh, this is the combi lift factory down in Monaghan, bottom left here, where they obviously have very heavy industrial machinery that, that's going around on the floor there. So we're using an EPS 300, very, very dense. Uh, and then just a light commercial project there where we would EPS 70s in the floor. Yeah, and just, ju just some real world uh, use of the, of the product just to show you what it looks like. Okay, so one more, more product to look at in terms of the floor. So we're, this is a, a different way of building. We're looking at our, our core insulated foundation system here. So this is a different way of building. Traditionally, we're looking at strip foundations and we're looking at raft foundations. If we're looking at a strip foundation, we, we, we would come onto site, we strip our, our topsoil vegetation there. We're gonna dig trenches. We're gonna pour concrete for our strip. We're gonna start bringing up rising walls. Um, a foundation system, uh, is a very, very different thing and a very, very different approach to that. Um, when we come onto site, we're going to strip our vegetation there, which we'd normally do, um, that topsoil there. After that, we've no more digging to do. We're going to start building up stone, um, a T2 compacted stone. We're going to put down essentially like a jigsaw of EPS and we're going to pour our ground floor into it. Um, it's a very, very simple way of building, uh, using less concrete, we're using less skilled labor. Um, so it's a different approach. Even when we compare it to a raft foundation, a raft foundation can be more complicated because we have the toes, we have very complicated steel. When we compare an insulated foundation system to a raft, raft type build, again, we can make life easy for ourselves. So why would we use an insulated foundation system? Well, we're going to be Morden and Zeb and Paratel compliant. So that's a very good reason to use it as a starting point. We're going to reduce our costs. We're not going to have as much skilled labor initially. If we're building masonry, the block layers will come in when our ground floor is done, not at the foundation stage. Uh, muck away is a huge cost, certainly when we're getting into development. When we're looking at developments, big residential developments, it's a huge cost. We were speaking to a developer recently, they've bought two landfill sites just purely to deal with muck. I mean, th there's no need for it. Why are we, why are we burying materials? Um, and the whole idea is we're trying to reduce our thermal bridging. So we're building onto insulation, we're wrapping the whole ground floor and we're returning it up at the perimeter and lining up with whatever the wall insulation is going to be to reduce our thermal bridging. And we're going to get a U value on the floors by default of around 0.1. So an insulated foundation system will get you well below any of the requirements of, of the building regulations. So you'll see in section here, this is a typical buildup. We have a masonry cavity wall, masonry cavity wall. This could be an internal uh, loaded internal wall or a party wall. Maybe it's a semi-D buildup. So we have 300 millimeters of EPS 100 under the floor, under the main part of the slab. The main slab is 150 mil thick. And essentially all we're doing is we're thickening that slab where we need to take load of the wall sitting on the, on the, the system itself. And as you can see, there is no bridge underneath this system. Everything is completely wrapped. We return the insulation up at the perimeter 
uh, and we line it up whatever the insulation is in the wall. So whatever the insulation in this wall, we maintain that thermal envelope all the way around that building. We've taken the slab as you, I've shown here. So this is in a, the internal leaf of, the, of a masonry wall. It's going to take in the, the floor loads, the wall loads, all that, or, or the floor and the roof loads. So we've taken the, 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 the concrete here to 250 mil tick. We'd have a certain amount of reinforcement and that's going to take our loads. We have the outer leaf in this case sitting on its own separate ring beam. Again, in case within the EPS. So the EPS is, is acting as a formwork for us as well. As I said, the internal, this is an internal wall, or it could be a party wall between buildings. And again, all we're doing is, is, is thickening that slab by an extra 100 mil. We're using our EPS 300 under here to take our loads. We're using our EPS under 300 here to take our loads. So where we'd normally have internal walls, party walls, we normally have, if we're looking at strips, we have a separate strip, we have a wall coming up. We're trying to put perimeter insulation in here to, to reduce that thermal bridging. This is going to solve a lot of these problems. It makes life very, very simple in terms of the construction. So as I mentioned, all we're doing is using a reinforced concrete slab. It's a 150 mil thick slab, and we've taken it where we need to carry structure above. It's used for the ground floor, obviously, uh, and it's an engineered system. So whatever the build type is, you're going to put on top of it, whatever the site conditions are, this system is designed to suit that. It's as simple as that. And we use two types of EPS, 300, or sorry, EPS, EPS 300 and 100. So the EPS 300 is that strong one, um, the, the really, really dense material where we need to take our loads and we're using concrete and steel. I have a little time-lapse video. Hopefully this, this, this works. So this, this will show you uh, a system going in in, uh, in real life. So if this is uh, the Barrow Peninsula down in Cork. We have, at this stage, they basically pull back the topsoil layer. They have their first T2 stone compacted in here, um, probably about 200 mil thick. After that, they're putting down the last T3 stone, which is a blinding layer. So it's 30 to 50 millimeters thick. I'm basically screeding that off as they go, making it very, very level. After that, it's like a jigsaw. You put down your perimeter EPS elements uh, and you basically just start filling in with insulation between that. Um, so you have one, two, this is second layer. If we've ducting for, for heat recovery, we can put it in there. We can put our radon down. We can put the radon under the system itself if we need to. And we put down our last layer of insulation, our reinforcement, our underfloor heating pipes, all in there. Actually, it's going to rain because it is the down south uh, and it is Ireland. We pour our concrete and job done. Standard concrete, nothing fancy there. Um, so it's a very, very simple, easy way to build in terms of time to build from green fields to concrete floor poured. If the crew know where they're at, eight to 10 days. Um, if we've the stone prepped and we're just setting out the EPS elements and the, 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 the steel reinforcements, um, it should take us maybe two days, three days maximum. One contractor was telling me him and two guys, they will have two uh, Paris MEDs ready every two days with reinforcement done, ready for concrete. So it's a very, very quick build method. And one of the huge reasons why you might choose an insulated foundation system is where Ireland's only certified by the NSI, Agriment Certified System, um, we spent a couple of years, two and a half years of, of, of a lot of diligence and hard work to get through the process with the NSCI because we we're the first, first ones in the country. So it was a new process with the NSCI to look at the, this type of a system. So we got our NSCI start last year around August. Um, as part of that, we've, we've developed a, ho a whole load of information to help people in the industry use the system, understand it, adopt it. Um, even so that's the, just the NSCI start itself. If we're structural engineers, if we're looking at projects and people want to assist with structural engineers, we have all that information for them. We have installation guides, we have training programs for installers for the system, we have construction details, and we have thermal modeling done, as was the case with all that kind of stuff. In terms of the, the system itself, we can use it with timber frame, we can use it with solid wall, with EWI, cavity wall, ICF, insulate concrete, SIP, steel frame, modular. Um, really, there, there, there isn't a huge... Uh, uh, restriction with using the system. Just to show you, I suppose, briefly how the, this is a very generalized idea of how the system works. We're using the EPS 300 below our, our thickened areas of the slab, so the EPS 300 there, and the stone build up below to help spread the load. So when we have a load coming down through the wall here, for instance, we have a certain compressive strength of the soil below it. We want the load by the time it hits the soil to be less than that compressive strength. 
that's that, that's essentially how it works. Simple idea, uh, but easy easy to work. And say these are some of the typical details. And we call these an F profile because this is kind of F shaped profile on its side. Uh, so this is a, a cavity wall construction again, just to show people the different types of systems. Systems. These are just standard buildups from our typical details. If you have a particular project, please reach out to us. I mean, we, we guide you and help you where you need to be. So these are all thermally modeled. And again, these, these, these form part of our, our cert certificate and the, the details to go with it. So it's cavity wall construction with, with insulation. Obviously we love to see bead in there, but I mean, if you need to use boards, uh, it can work at that as well. Standards here on the right-hand side, timber frame, masonry, outer leaf detail. Uh, again, the whole idea is we're getting this insulation, we have a high level of insulation on the floor, we're wrapping it around the outside of the floor, and we're lining it up with whatever the insulation is in the wall. So in this case, this is an L-shaped type profile. We have a solid wall with EWI. In this case, we have an ICF detail. So uh, the whole idea is every time we get a full wrap, we're maintaining that thermal envelope. So just in terms of, I suppose, some again, some real life figures and Y values and Psi values, uh, we took a typical semi-detached house that we were supplying a foundation system to and we modeled it. Um, we got our FRSI, so to comply with regs, our FRSI, our, the difference between inside temperature to outside temperature has to be above 0.75, so we're getting 0.93, we got our Psi values, but the, the, but the, the really good thing is when you model the, the whole house, the, the Y value is coming in at 0 0.037. So when you, you look at every junction, floor to wall, wall to roof, the penetrations of the opes, everything that, that that's a terrible bridge in that building, and you model it um, with the fabric being right. We're getting those low U values. We're getting your terrible bridging reduced. Um, we can save money on that fabric. But we can also save money on the build. So the Y value came in at 0 0.037. Now, as far as I'm aware, if we use ACDs, our, our Y value comes in at 0 0.08. So we can get well be, well below that. Again, it, it's it's reducing that. That I suppose having us to, to lean on other other parts of the build, if we get these these fabrics right, um, just some I suppose a little bit more unusual details. Um, so this one here is uh, where we might have a highly loaded area. So we might have a steel beam or steam column coming down here that's having extra very extra loads. Where it goes beyond the capacity of an EPS, we can introduce compact foam in here, um, which will allow us to take. Uh, greater strength of a point load, uh, and we might have a small concrete pad underneath it again. So there's ways and means of accommodating everything. We have steps in the foundation. So again, you could have a party wall with a step, different levels, uh, retaining walls, basements. It's, it's, it's a very versatile system. It can be designed to suit a lot, lot of different scenarios and it can solve a, a lot of problems on site as well. I mean, we're looking at, at, at I suppose, poor sites um, and how to get around those. The, the, the foundation system can help there. The last, the last product that, that I have here for you, and it's just one slide, and then I have some, some case studies, uh, real world case studies here for you. Just core lock. When we're looking at pitch roof insulation, um, something like this core lock product is very suitable. So it's essentially, it's, a, it's an EPS 70. So it's a 70 KPA board, um, silver color. And we have these little slits in it. I'm sure people have seen this before. And we use it between the rafters. Um, again, because we have that compression of the material we're going up there, we're not going to have any air gaps, reducing that thermal looping again, even in the in the roof scenario. And because it's an EPS, the, it's not going to change shape over time. There's no gases there to escape over time. And we can use it along with a sarking insulation. We can supply an EPS sarking insulation or an insulation internally, depending on when you're looking at a warm roof or a cold roof, cold roof build. Again, we've designed guides and all this, lots of different details, uh, U-value tables that people can reach out to us for. Yeah, you know, we're happy to help. If you look at even just flat roofs, inverted roofs, we can help you out with that as well. Okay, some case studies. So first one is uh, a one-off. So case study number one was a one-off build for in Ballymore uses. Um, this was a, um, it turned out actually they, they went fully certified passive house for this one. And um, they went with EWI, so they went with solid wall construction. And they went with 250 mil of our silver EPS and they got a U value of 0.12. They used the insulated foundation system and they achieved a floor U value of 0 0.09. So as you can see, both of those figures well below the requirements of the building regs. The 0.15, obviously they're using underfloor heating in this case. So that was the requirement there. So they're well below that. The contractor, Pat Dorn, this was his first time using the insulated foundation system. 
since then, he, the, him or his crew do not want to do uh, strip foundations anymore. And um, basically, they found it so easy to use and, and, and everything really stacked up for them. Um, when we're looking at one-off houses, normally we'd say to people, if you're looking at a one-off house uh, and an insulated foundation, system, the cost could be around cost neutral. So you might spend the same money to get the ground floor level, but you're going to get your, your fabric uh, far more uh, beneficial fabric. So you're going to get a, a lower U value. You're going to reduce your thermal bridging um, by default with, the, with that type of system. So if you can get better for the same money, why not use it? But in this case, and it can be the case in a lot of times, um, so Pat did up some costing for us. Uh, he costed the traditional strip route. Uh, as you see, there's a large element of floor screed in there, which you don't use in a foundation system because we're using the uh, underfloor heating pipes in the concrete slab, we're using that thermal mass. So there was a big difference, 4,700 odd of a saving by using an insulated foundation system. And the big thing was, even using the, the foundation system, you were, bear in mind we are getting a lower U value by, by using that as well. So it, it really does kind of make sense from, from that point of view. Um, on the grander scale of things, uh, development, and this is featured in, in Passive House magazine, as you can see there, Dirk and Residential. This is the third phase of a, of a development. Phase one and two, standard construction. Phase three, they went back to the drawing board, decided, oh, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to push ourselves a little bit more here. They wanted to aim for, for certified passive houses. So this was our biggest certified passive house developments at the time. Um, they used an insulated foundation system and they used, uh, they used external insulation. But the key thing was... Uh, and, and what they were able to do was sell the house as, as a passive house to the homeowner for the exact same cost as the people who had bought the houses in phase one and two. So when we're talking about changes in building regulations and pressures and all that kind of stuff, people were saying new regs is going to have an implication of maybe seven to eight percent on our building costs. These people, and there's more since that have proved otherwise. We can build better, we can get the fabrics right, and it's not necessarily going to cost us any more. Uh, so there, that that's essentially proof in the in the pudding from from these guys. And again, they've 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 taken that build type onto onto their development since. That's just some pictures from site. So because it was a a wall with external insulation on it, it's these kind of L shaped profiles. You can see here it's a mitered corner. So when we send that material to site, the guys on site get a plan from us. They get an installation drawing, and it's basically follow the numbers for the perimeter. Piece one goes here. Corner three goes here. Corner four goes here. Everything is cut exactly to size. So we're not cutting material, wasting it on site. Again, throwing it into landfills. It's a lot more efficient. And just some comments from site. Obviously, reduction in skilled labor. The block areas wouldn't come in, weren't coming in until the ground floor was in. Less concrete and blocks. Reduction in muck away, which is a hugely costly thing. Even just as, even a simpler thing, cleaner site. Um, they felt that, you know, that the site was a lot cleaner. We're dragging muck around the place. We're building up stone. Last case study, uh, and this is a simple enough one. It's just, it's an independent costing that, that we got. Um, it was comparing the three, three build types. So uh, standard foundation with strips, uh, standard foundation raft, and our insulated foundation system for a pair of semi-detached houses, typical design on a, on a project. Um, our costings came in at, I say ours, it was the, the, the QS who did this for us. Um, the QS came in with the inside foundation system, 14,200, strip foundation, 15,700, and raft foundation, 17,400. So there's a big saving over the raft and still a nice saving over the strip. We supplied a, a foundation system to a development down in Clare recently, and they were suggesting that their savings were probably equally around this, if not maybe a tiny bit more. So again, we don't have to have cost implications to get a lower U-value, to get our terminal bridging sorted, to get our fabric right. We can possibly save money. And this is becoming increasingly more important. And again, this is this was featured in Passive House magazine. Um, it was a comparison and looking at the different ways of building embodied carbon. And um, basically they, they did a study on the, on the foundation system. And they said, well, we can save money here. But the big thing is we're using 50% less concrete. Our embodied carbon is dramatically reducing by using this type of build type. We're not putting concrete and blocks in the ground just for the sake of it. Reducing those materials is certainly, certainly a big thing. And we're seeing that more coming through with the inquiries from, from the, the, the industry now with, with uh, architects uh, asking us more about that, which leads nicely into this, which is our EPD, our Environmental Product Declaration. 
So uh, we were the first board manufacturer in the country to get this. So basically this states your environmental impact from raw material through to production through to the material on site. Um, so if you're using LEED or Briam software, you get greater energy credits of using a product with, a, with an EPD. Government projects that are asking for the products must have an EPD. Um, a lot more councils, architects, people specifying materials are starting to require EPDs for materials. So we have that there, which is a great thing to have. A lot of work gone into it, but it was, it was really good to get it across the line. So we're nearly there. Okay, two more slides. Uh, technical services. So what we can do for you, you know, the, everybody's busy. Um, so if somebody can partner up with you and help you out and make your life a little bit easier, it's, it's obviously, I'm sure, very welcome. We can help you. As I mentioned, we've designed guides for all these materials. We, have, we can do, help you with U value calculations. You can comply with your, your BCARP. We have CE marking. We have NSAI uh, certificates. We have our DLPs. Even just simple details, we've AutoCAD, PDF. If you go onto our site, you can download Revit files, all fully compliant for the new part L and beyond. Uh, they're there ready to go on their proper, proper Revit files, stacked walls, nice, nice, nice files that you can work with and import. Uh, even just a simple thing of, and it's hard, well, hard to do at the moment, is an on site visit. If somebody wants to see a foundation system in the flesh, we can organize that for you. But essentially, Obviously, we want you to have the confidence in, in core insulation as a company that we can help you out with your pro projects and give you all that back of information that you need. So when we look at the poor stressed individual at the start of my presentation, hopefully by the time you, you've used uh, core as a company and you, you can see what we can do for you, and even just looking at our bonded bead or insulated foundation system, how you can see how it impacts your product, we, certainly in terms of skilled labor, uh, the quality of the build, compliance and certification, we can make life a lot easier with pe for, for, for people by using our systems and our products. Whew. And that's me. <laughs> I'll be getting a drink now shortly. Um, so that's my email address. Um, if, if, if anybody wants to reach out to me, please do, by all means. I'm only happy to, to, to help in any way, shape or I can, um, whatever it may be. So I'm going to hand you back to you now. Thanks, Andrew. That was fantastic. Um, like you last week, I've learned a few things. I did not know that you had carried out your thermal modeling to that level. Huge innovation and look, that's it. Um, an yes. undervalued kind of resource in the industry. So yeah, everyone needs to know about that. So that's that's huge. Um, yeah, and absolutely. Same with the EPDs. Great work ahead of the curve <laughs> again. That's really impressive. So um, lots of questions in, Andrew. So um, we'll kind of get started. Um, <laughs> absolutely. You've covered, yeah. you've covered some of them um, kind of during the presentation anyway. Sure. But, um, this is a question that I've heard asked before, I guess. Can any insulation be used to fill hollow cavity block walls or does it work against the build? No, uh, if you have a hollow block wall, there's nothing you can do with it, I'm afraid, I'm afraid in terms of filling it. You either go externally or you go internally. Uh, ideally, externally is, is the way to go. Um, if you look even at that Durkin residential build, they actually used a hollow block and they went with external insulation and they modeled it and, and they made good use of the, I suppose, the air within the cavity of the block itself. Um, but unfortunately, you can't fill the cavity of a block itself. Which is good advice. Um, can EPS be recycled? Is it a sustainable product? I know you can recycle in the factory your offcuts, but um, I guess how would you answer that? Yes, yes, the, it can be recycled. Um, there, there, we, we, as I mentioned, yes, we, we recycle our own material in site. We, we have trialed a few uh, recycling projects with customers on the EWI end of things um to see how we could work with people from site to take back their material to recycle it obviously trying to take it back in, in a clean state a usable state that we can recycle it and we're hopefully going to be doing that more and more over the, the coming year and trying to I suppose, put together a, a finalized project on that there is a company as well if anybody ever needs details reach out to me i can give give that to you who recycle eps and they basically they, they travel the country, take it, they'll crush it, recycle it, and they'll do all that kind of stuff. So it can be used, even at the end of life of building, it can be reused and recycled. Brilliant. That's a nice advantage. Mm. Um, 
question you probably have never been asked before. How does your <laughs> product compare to foil-backed products on the market in relation to recycling oh, yes. and lifespan? Oh yes, I've never heard that one before. <laughs> well, well, well. Obviously, the the the, the foil type products can't be recycled, so it's landfill. But that EPS can be, in terms of its 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 life cycle and performance. Um, we don't have any gases within our product. Um, so it's thermal and it's physical performance will stay the same over the lifetime of the building. Unfortunately, with, with, with some of the materials that would have those gases, inject them and the, the foil and the idea of the foil is to try and keep the gases in. Unfortunately, to get, when the gases escape over time, it reduces the thermal, possibly the physical performance of the, of the material. So EPS will stand, stand up. Uh, when you're using it on a, even say, for an example, a floor comparing like for like, you'll always use a little bit thicker of an EPS. So if you're looking at a PIR, maybe 120 mil, you might use a 160 mil of an EPS uh, initially. Now you'll, you should be able to save money even at the 160 mil, but obviously the product is, is going to stay exactly the same over time. So it, yep. should, be, it should stack up really, 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 really well. Great. Um, probably, I guess this question is kind of answered in your EPD. What is the embodied carbon for EPS and how would it compare to other insulation types in the market and maybe that's the purpose of the EPD that we need other manufacturers to get to your level to offer the EPDs that you can carry out that comparison. Exactly yeah even in the if you look at the BRE grain guides EPS is an A plus rating um, so that the, I suppose that the embodied carbon and material within the EPS certainly stacks up very well. Yeah okay what is the bonding agent agent for bonding bead? It's essentially it's essentially a, a glue. Um, it's obviously it's a glue that that does, doesn't affect the EPS and the idea of it. It doesn't have, it doesn't uh, add to the thermal performance of the material. The EPS the 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 performance is measured on the EPS alone. So the idea of the glue is essentially just to hold it in place to to basically that the, the material tacks together, forms a little bit of a mass. So if you were to take out core wall at a later stage, take out a window or a door, that the bead doesn't come out of the cavity. It's really just that's the only reason for it. Great. I think you've answered a second question in that one, but um, okay. here's another one kind of related, I guess. How does the product prevent moisture from getting to the inner leaf? So the, if, the, if, if you have a bonded bead and you fully fill that cavity, even if it's, even if it's a retrofit situation, we can use bead in a standard masonry with an air gap of 40 millimeters or greater. So um, if you're looking at retrofits, a typical scenario is probably about 50 millimeters of an air gap. It's a way that the, I suppose the beads, if you remember back to that picture, that kind of matrix where the beads touching in places, there's still, a, 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 I suppose, a patch. So if you imagine if there was moisture that formed on the inner side of that, of that outer leaf, or there was a, a, a break in the joint or something like that, the moisture, it will still flow down through the bead. So it'll only pass even under pressure, maybe about 10% of that volume of bead, but it will still move down through it. Clear. And that's part of the, as well as the, the driving rain tests that we do as part of all our BBA stuff and NSEI. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's a, a short one here. Do the SEAI allow for pumped bead to a cavity with brick externally? Grant work. I guess you covered that one. That one's pretty Yes, yes, they, they, they do. Obviously, the contractor just needs to do their usual checks. Even in an ex a highly exposed area, it can be done once the cavity is, is, is up to performance and the, the brick joints are correct. Um, a question on the cost per square meter for core fill 170. Uh, at a rough guess, depending on where you are in the country, could be 13 to 15 euros a square meter, something like that, uh, I suppose, and depending on the size of the contract. If it's a one-off house, you're going to be at the higher end of it. If you're into development, you're going to be on the lower end of that. So yeah. Rough, yeah. as a rough idea. Yeah, and I know anecdotally the labour shortages that we can expect this year kind of and. I know the trades or block layers seem less keen to, well, they're maybe never keen to install the boards. So um, that kind of a price probably is getting much more attractive. It certainly is. I mean, even, even if you look at the cost of a board uh, and you're just buying the board versus the cost of the bead that goes into that cavity, the bead is cheaper. Yeah. yeah. It's compelling. Um, <laughs> the wind driven rain map, who yeah. generated that? Um, and Maybe a question who other than core states that bonded bead is not suitable for the brick finish in severe exposure. Now, I guess this one has something to do with you being the only one with the NSAI cert and therefore the only one having gone through that process. Yes, using yeah. That map. Um, um, I suppose that the map has been in ver uh, previous versions of the certs. The map was created with the NSAI and the meteorological uh, 
yeah. Ireland department, I suppose. Um, we were actually hoping that we're going to break it up a little bit more, give it, give a little bit more uh, allowances within it, um, but it, that's not the case. And I suppose since since our cert has been uh, adopted with all these new changes, it's led on to other people. So once somebody has a cert, an NSEI cert for bonded bead, they will have to uh, comply with that 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 map as yeah. well. So it'll it'll apply to everyone, not just ourselves. Great. Um, th are the junctions that you've shown modelled, are they modelled by an NSA registered assessor and pe can people use them as part of their DEEP or SEAI um, assessments? Yes, certainly there's a handful of NSEI uh, registered modellers. Uh, we use uh, one of them. Um, if people want to know who it is, I can tell you. But uh, yes, absolutely 100% certified models. I know that's unique in the market, so that's that's really exciting. Um, is the external insulation fireproof? The external insulation is uh, the insulation itself has a class E fire rating. So EPS has a class E fire rating. When you use EPS as part of uh, an overall render system, you will achieve the A ratings for the, the fire uh, performance because the render system essentially gives the, the yeah. EPS its fire rating for an external insulation system. Um, you can use it up to 18 meters. Uh, once you go above 18 meters, they tend to go more towards the, the stone wall type products. Uh, but most of the, the EPS, EPS render systems are certified up to 18 meters. And in fact, since all of that, that uh, I suppose the problems generated by the, the incorrect use of materials and not having fire stops in, 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 in the Grenfell, the NSEI re-looked at all the systems late last year. So they're, they're more than happy with it to stand as yeah. it is. Very good. Um, with external wall insulation fixed over um, cast solid blockwork walls, is it necessary to remove the rough cast? Um, uh, yeah, I suppose. I suppose it, the rough cast is uh, probably what you do is you take out some of the, I suppose, the roughness with some of the the, the adhesive, the base coat. That's what they, what they would normally do if it was maybe um, a render like a pebble dash or something like that, they'd probably remove some of the, the pebble dash and try yeah. and remove some of that to put before they put on the insulation. Uh, so there is probably a little bit more work compared to just a standard rendered finish. Great. It's a good question. What is the percentage of shrinkage that you would expect in 50 years on EWI? I guess on, yeah. on the... Oh, well, certainly on, on the EPS, zero. Yeah, it's a good answer. Uh, 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 and And... Like even even if if you look at some of the independent studies and you compare, they they've removed EPS from the ground from 15, 20 years down the road, and they've measured the thermal and the physical performance. And he's doing exactly the same, and that's why when again if you if you if you're using a different product that's in a roof space and you're trying to cut it between the joists, the problem is that stuff will probably shrink over time as it off gases as well. So it's not a good thing. Yeah, I've, I've kind of went down that rabbit hole once and came to that <laughs> conclusion as well. Um, is 200, 215 block on EWI a solid or hollow block? I guess that's a solid block. It's a block on flat. Um, uh, yes, generally a block on flat. Um, can pumped bead be used to top up a cavity fill where the cavity was filled with blown silicone treated fiberglass in the mid 80s? No, you would have to extract that material before you could use a bead. Uh, a bead can be used, as I mentioned, from a 40 mil air gap up, uh, but it has to be a certain type of material. So you can use it with an EPS, a PIR type material, or if it's a mineral fiber bat. Anything yep. pretty much outside of it, if it's a blown fiber, it would have to be removed first. Um, the question from Regan, are you saying that I can EWI an old, an old stone building? Yes, you can indeed. And there's a case study on our website showing one or two of those, if I remember yeah. rightly. Definitely one. Definitely yeah. one. It's preferred, I think, if it's possible. It's, uh, yes, yes. It's uh, outside possible. outside rather than inside, but it just makes those big walls breed a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is the max and min depth of stone beneath an insulated foundation system? So the minimum would be 200 mil of a T2 stone. That would be done in a couple of layers, compacted. And then we have a 30 to 50 mil uh, stone on top of that for the blinding. Below that, again, that T2 stone can go up to about 900 mil, uh, 750 mil deep at times, depending on the, the, the gradient of the site. And we can use different densities of stone, T1s, T0s, if we have really uh, big uh, 
uh, I suppose, gaps that we need to make up or if we're, we're taking away very poor soil or if we're trying to accommodate for slopes. So we can go very, very deep with it. Great. Um, how close can the face of the external wall be to a boundary when using the core insulation system? And I'm going to roll it into another question. Can you use it on sloping sites? Uh, sloping sites for the foundation system, yes, no problem. And is the 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 boundary wall for was that probably for the foundation system as well? Was it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So boundary wall, we would require probably about a meter. Um, because normally about a meter from the perimeter, we have a land drain, which we show in our details. So you're probably talking about a minimum, a minimum of about a meter from a, from a boundary wall to use the system, because we need to extend that stone and have a compaction there, uh, that kind of distance out. And we have yeah. to have a, obviously a, a known compaction on that. Question from Colm. Can we use the insulated foundation with a solid wall? So I guess he's talking at 215 block on the insulated foundation and your EWI outside that. Yes, absolutely. All day long. Um, we've supplied lots of projects like that. Absolutely. It's a very uncomplicated way to deal with the thermal bridging. Exactly. Very, very simple. You've thermal mass in the floor, you've thermal mass in the walls, and you're, you're maximizing both. It works very, very well. Yeah. With a heated underfloor system, would vermin be a problem eating away the insulation? Uh, no, it wouldn't be, is, is, is the answer. Basically, the, the, because it's a synthetic material, it doesn't provide any uh, nutrition for them. So vermin don't have any interest in it. Even, um, even I suppose the way that we dress the, the, the perimeter radon as well, um, they certainly won't get through a compacted stone. So the, I suppose the only potential risk you might have of vermin getting near the system will be around footpath level. But the way that we dress the radon, it counters for that anyway. Great. Um, this question has come up in a couple of forms. Um, how does the EPS system accommodate structural steel frames? I guess that part is easy but is core the certifier and designer so what some others had asked directly was um i want to use your system i already yep. have my engineer how does it work okay okay we we don't we don't provide the the uh, structural design uh, and we are not the the, the certifier so we, we we simply manufacture the system the way that it works it can work a couple of ways if you have an engineer that you're currently engaged with on, on a project whether it be from a one-off to a development, we can engage with your engineer, give them the information that they need, examples, and show them how the system works, uh, the, the compressive strength material, give them our, our structural design guide that they can design the system. Uh, yep. Either or, we can, we can supply you with, I suppose, the name of an engineer who will design the system for you, um, who would be familiar with that type of design. And whoever that engineer ends up being, whether it be your engineer or maybe something that you're bringing in just purely to take on that element of it, they will, they will issue their certification best based on their designs. Great. Um, how does EPS compare with the structural XPS for foundations in terms of cost? So I guess this is the insulated foundation system as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the EPS, in, like if you were to compare an EPS 300 versus an XPS 300, it's probably not a huge amount of, of difference in the cost. The big thing is, is with, with EPS is that we can shape it. We can yeah. profile it. The XPS as an extruded product, it works very, very differently. So if you can imagine all the different shapes that we have uh, when it comes to a foundation system, all the different profiles, and every one of them changes from, from project to project, there's no way you could keep uh, an extruded material. It just doesn't lend itself to it. Yeah. Um, do you have details for level thresholds with the insulated foundations? So I guess that's how does the door sit on that and how do you deal with part M? Yes, yes, we have level threshold details. I have them for L-shaped profiles and F-shaped profiles. So if, you, if, you, if you've taken down my email address, pop me an email and I'll gladly send them on to you. Yeah, okay. Um, is there a structural issue when exceeding the 150 cavity width? I guess that one is pretty uncomplicated. It's a different size tie. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I suppose that the building regulations, and I, again, I hate to be saying this, we were the first to market launch again. But <laughs> So the building regulations gave, uh, and, and all the, the instruments of, of construction there, they gave very little guidance. It was at 150 mil cavity. After that, you have to engage an engineer. It has to be an engineered cavity. So it went to the trolls that went NSCI uh, to get our updated agreement cert. And they certify up to 225 mil cavity without the need for an engineering component. We even specify in the NSCI cert the size of the ties, the spacing of the ties. Obviously, it's a slightly heavier tie, but you're using less of them. So there's yeah. no issue going up to 225 as part of the NSCI certification.
so lots of room to have a yeah much lower okay. if we need it um two questions again we will relate them um, mm -hmm. can we do split floor housing and renovations and extensions uh if it's with the the foundation system yes we can do different 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 levels of floor very very simple and we can maintain that terminal envelope that wrap all the way around it uh we we can do basements we can do retaining walls as part of the bills no issues at all uh, if you can use it as a, you can use the, the insulated foundation system as part of a, an extension project, certainly, um, depending on the size of it. We've done small ones, we've done big ones. When it gets to the smaller ones, probably the, it, the cost efficiency isn't quite so much there because you've a little bit more engineering input into it. And uh, when it gets to the bigger extensions, obviously it starts, to, it starts to make a little bit more sense, but either way it can be used. Have you compared the different wall thicknesses required to achieve a certain new value for different insulation products and compare it to the embodied carbon for other types of insulation? Um, so really, yeah, PIR, I guess, is the question here, the EPS. Yes, yes. Well, uh, I, I certainly did it from a costing point of view. So I, I went with a 150 mil cavity uh, with a partial fill board to get to the new backstop requirements of 0.18. And I used a 170 mil cavity uh, with a bead to get to the, to the 0.18. We're going to have uh, bigger heads, bigger sills, slightly maybe wider strips. Just looking at standard strip foundations, I cost up everything. Uh, the board, the fitting of the board versus the installed price of the bead. And we were easily 15% cheaper by using a bead, even with the wider cavity, allowing for the the, the change in materials um in terms Without of the, taking the other things into account which yeah 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 have benefits yeah i haven't done it done it's done it done a car an embodied carbon study on it now to be honest with you um in the ewi can the insulation be layered applied in two layers so if people want to stagger the joints and is there guidelines on that um ideally EWI render systems will always want you to do the board in, in one layer even even if it's up to 300 mil thick um, it, in terms of how their system works and they're, they're, they're depending on the, on the shear strength and the pull out strength of the material itself. If you start using different layers uh, and the, maybe one isn't sitting quite right yeah. and it, it, it just brings, into, it brings in a potential issue there. Yeah, additional labor, I guess, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, pros and cons of um, spray foam insulation versus EPS. <laughs> another um soft one for you there <laughs> <laughs> nice handy one yeah. uh, there's open cell and closed cell uh spray foam i'm not an expert um if you're using spray foam um they obviously they have their their nsai certifications i'm sure people saw that there was a case recently uh, in the newspapers and that was publicized and stuff like that but i don't particularly want to start shooting down someone's someone's, someone's product um I suppose it has, it has its uses. Um, the only thing is be careful if you're using it in, certainly in a retrofit, that you have that air gap. If it was used in a, in a pitch roof situation, that you have the, a card in there, an air gap, because you don't want uh, materials flush with that or straight up to that, 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 that uh, felt that has to be breathable. So just a couple of things. So, I mean, yeah. it has its uses. Somebody is asking, is there a test you can do to carry out or to ensure that the bonded beads are installed correctly after installation? So really, it's a question of thermal modeling, I guess, of thermal imaging afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the with the, the drill patterns, the, the flow rates that everyone, everyone uh, I suppose, monitors from an installer point of view and, and the way that they're, they're, I suppose, they're trained and the, the they will ensure even even it's 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 amazing when you see the guys doing it when they're they have the the gun in the wall there's a five or six bar pressure there when that's completely full they get a push back on it and they know straight away even mm -hmm. so they have the the but I, I i was i was talking to a guy i knew through another 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 uh, interest and uh, he got his, his house built he went for passive he did a 200 mil cavity and he told the contractor i'll be doing a thermal imaging here later when you're finished yeah. And he checked it and he didn't have any issues at all. So that was that was good to hear. Yeah, there is, um, I'm sure there's a there's a, a U value measurement kit that you can use for, for mm. retrofits, but that's in the same way as um, thermal modeling. It needs to be yes. done by the right person at the right time of year to have genuine results. Yes, yes. Um, can you can the U value for cavity walls be achieved with a 150 mil cavity and EPS? 
on its own without any other. So I guess can can we be NZ compliant with one fifty mil pumped bead? Um, to get to the backstop U value, the answer would be no. One fifty mil cavity would probably see a U value of point two. Saying that we don't have to hit every single backstop to be compliant with yeah. part L. We can we can adjust things in different ways to make up for it. It's not something maybe that I'd necessarily agree with myself, but um, you could use a 150 mil and even a cavity and even a 20 mil board internally would get you to that new U value, but 150 mil won't get to the backstop. Okay. Um, with the EPS beads where you're pumping over a long window or door unit, um, how do you ensure the bead fill underneath the DPC cavity tray? Okay, so anyone that 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 that's pumping, so an installer who's pumping bead around a sill or a head or a window, they have certain spacing. So uh, if memory serves about two hundred mil centers that they have to drill. So if your if your if your head is two meters long, obviously you have a certain amount of drill points, and it can be done from the inside on the new build uh, around the the sills would be the same thing. So there's very specific centers that that they have to drill at and positions from the ends to make sure that they get a complete fill. Somebody's asking, do you have a BBA standard? So I guess in addition to that, if not, can your products be used in the UK? Uh, we have BBA for our bonded bead product, yes. Uh, currently, any of our products can be used in the, the United Kingdom with the current NSEI C marking and DOPs. When they change over to the UK CA uh, on the 1st of January 2022, it remains to be seen whether they will accept the NSEI certs or whether we have to go and get new CE marking, we're looking into it at the moment. We're going to have, uh, our, 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 I suppose, our, our game plan ready anyway, just in case they don't. Um, it's still all up in the air. It's as, it's as much of a mess as Brexit was. So unfortunately, I can't answer you know, to the end degree. <laughs> There's a, another question from Tony. Um, how has remedial work on an insulated foundation system been carried out where differential settlement occurs? Um, I can jump in with that one if you want, but I guess it's um, that's not something that should happen with a new build differential settlement on a new foundation. Um, really should be designed out, um, Tony. So it's it's definitely not something that should occur. No, exactly. Yeah. I exactly. I mean, this system's been used in Scandinavian countries for for forty odd years, and they've, they've less issue with these because they're structurally designed compared yeah. to the rule of thumb you do is use with a standard strip. Yeah. Cool. Um, is there a recommended detail for closing a 200 mil cavity at wall plate level for core fill? Um, basically, you can. The, 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 there's, there's. If it's a one-off house, assuming it is, uh, a, a rigid installation material can be used to close off that cavity. You can use a proprietary cavity closer if you particularly wanted. You could use a fire-rated cavity closer. But um, once it's compliant with the building regulations, we don't have any requirements over and above what that would be. Yeah. Um, last one, you get a break soon, Andrew. Um, <laughs> oh no, it's great, it's great. <laughs> how do solid walls breathe with EWI? How do solid walls breathe with EWI? Okay, so the the I suppose if we're looking at a solid wall and EWI, um, I suppose the, the EPS as a material has a certain element of vapor transition ability with it as well. So as a material, it does have a, a little bit of vapor that will allow through the material. The way that the, 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 the structure will work, when you look at the moisture point and the condensation risk, it'll always occur outside of the EWI with a, a solid wall construction. So I suppose it's only really moisture from the air. As, point, as part of, I suppose, the, the building regulations, we're going to have a certain amount of uh, and you, again, you would know probably know a lot more about this than I would of controls internally in terms of our, our moisture content. But I suppose if the if the if the block actually did get wet or something like that, it would still be an element that would transition through the EPS. Yeah, it's my experience that those walls work really really well from yeah. a breathability point of view. Um, mm -hmm. There's a question here from Carlos: Does the radon layer need to be sandwiched in the EPS? I know you could cover that. It basically it can be under or on top. Um, either either seems to be okay. Yes, yeah. Um, last question, hopefully. So, or not hopefully, <laughs> I should say, but hopefully for you. <laughs> Can the external insulation be paired with corrugated iron cladding? Th this type of cladding is becoming popular in rural Ireland. Yes, yes, yes. Um, regular inquiries around 
metal type. I did zinc cladding inquiry there yesterday. Um, so you, if, if you have a masonry construction, you can put your, your, your insulation, in this case, obviously we're talking about EPS, you can put your EPS on there. You can put um, a vapor control there, or you can put a base coat of the, the render system. You can put a, a carrier system then that would be fixed up, whether it be a timber batten or rail that would be fixed back through the EPS, back to the masonry substrate, and you can hang your, your, your metal finish or whatever it's going to be, whether it be timber finish on the outside of that. So very regular construction. I don't see any huge issues with that. Any, any of the, the certified render systems, they all have details for that anyway. So there shouldn't be any issue. Very good. Excellent. Andrew, you've been fantastic. That's brilliant. Thanks, um, thanks everybody. Yeah, I just want to do a short, obviously, thanks to Andrew, but thanks to everyone for attending, staying on. I just want to give you an idea of what's upcoming. So um, on Thursday, we have Heat Pump Solutions with Daikin. Next week, we'll be looking forward to windows from Norden. Windows are an, another kind of huge area. They're the area that sees the biggest movement in improvements with U-values. And session five is timber frame structures. So I'm excited to see that type of technology brought to the wider market as well. It's going to be really good for people to see how all that works. Um, week four, we will be looking at the ventilation system. So a big part of NZEB and on the same day, a final plenary where Jeff Colley will be um, chairing the plenary. So um, just to confirm again, the session overall has been recorded. You will receive a, a, a link afterwards. So yeah, even if you had colleagues that weren't able to attend, they'll be able to pick up the video on it afterwards. So th thanks again to Andrew and to all, and um, hopefully see you on Thursday. Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.